Oh, yeah. Uh, so just before the break, we were looking at how uh, certain angels did not keep their position of authority. They abandoned their proper dwelling. You know, So those are the terms that I used. Uh, they did not keep their position of authority, and they abandoned their proper dwelling. And one detailed example of that would be you know, what Satan did. Uh, and that gets described in Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 15. So if someone could read out for us uh, Isaiah 14, 12 to 15, and watch out in what way uh, you know uh, Satan did not keep his position of authority, and watch out for in what way he abandoned his proper dwelling. This, the, both of these things get described in Isaiah 14, 12 to 15. Uh, so if someone could read out for us Isaiah 14, 12 to 15. How oh, you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend from the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. So we see over here, um, uh, Satan is among those angels who did not keep their position of authority. He, he says to himself, I will make myself like the Most High. So rather than being the guardian cherub that he was created to be, he wanted to be something else. And in the same way also, he abandoned his proper dwelling. It says over here, you know, uh, um, uh, Satan says to himself in his heart, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. You know, the star, the term over here, stars, um, that is used in uh, at least four or five places to talk about the angels. Okay, so in fact, that, that term is used even of Satan himself, it, you know, um, in Revelation where it says, uh, the star which fell from heaven. You know, so over there, the term star is being actually used for angels. So over here, uh, Satan says to himself, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly. In other words, he's saying, you know, I'll become the ruler rather than God being the ruler who's ruling over them. I will become their ruler because I think I'm great enough, you know, so he he gets puffed up with pride. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, so yeah, so we see that um, that 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 cause that is the main cause for why these particular angels chose to fall. They were not no longer happy with the position that had been designated to them. They wanted to become something bigger, greater than what God had appointed for them. Um, and so we see judgment coming upon them. And um, um, Yeah, uh, so Luke 10, 17 to 19, of course, talks about what was done to Satan. And we are, in fact, familiar with that passage. Uh, so if, if you could have someone read out Luke 10, 17 to 19, please. Luke 10, 17 to 19. And the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So we see here that um, uh, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So there was a fall from heaven um, where you know Satan is 
thrown to the earth and uh, because of that uh, the believers who place themselves under jesus authority they can overcome all the power of the enemy not because they have any special strength but because they have chosen to place themselves under his covering and he imparts his authority to them so through him in his name they are able to exercise authority over this um, uh, evil one which has who has fallen like lightning from heaven um, but we saw earlier in jude when you when we read that particular verse over there that some of them are, are being held in darkness they have been bound up uh, so they are they don't have the freedom to roam around they are be, they have been placed in some dark place uh, and being held over there till the day of judgment uh, and we see the same thing repeated again even in uh, 2 Peter 2.4 where it says, uh, If God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. So here it's very clearly saying uh, he sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. So um, both in Jude and in Second Peter, it's, it seems to be saying that there are some fallen angels who were not just simply thrown down to the earth, but they, uh, they are being held already somewhere. And we see, uh, so when we, when, we, when, we, when we look at this, uh, you know, we, the, the request which those uh, demons made to Jesus, you know, in that particular story, uh, you know that that begins to make more sense. So maybe we could, we could actually look at that and look at the words which they used over there. You know when they when they are talking to Jesus, uh, Luke chapter eight, thirty to thirty three. Luke eight, thirty to thirty three, please. Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that he would permit them to enter them. And he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. So we see over here that uh, these particular demons have not been tied up and, you know, and chained in darkness for judgment yet. They are still roaming around freely. And so they repeatedly, it says over here, they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. Uh, so which means they have not been confined. Uh, so there seem to be two categories of uh, fallen angels. There are some that have already been tied up and are being held in darkness uh, for the day of judgment. But there are others which are still roaming around freely and God has permitted it because in his wisdom, he has some plan and purpose even for that. All right. So uh, uh, this is what we learn about what kind of judgment has been brought upon them. Um, but of course, in the end times, we know that they all will be judged uh, because in Matthew 25, 41, um, you know, Jesus actually refers to that. He says, uh, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So there is an eternal fire that is prepared for the devil and his angels. And all of them will, will, you know, will be thrown over there one day. Uh, but for now, some of them have been given temporary freedom to be able to roam around on the earth. And uh, uh, there's an interesting thing said about this judgment, which is going to come upon them. Uh, that would be in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 3. If someone could read out for us, 1 Corinthians 6, 3.
do you not know that we will judge angels how much more the things of this life we are told over here that the believers will have some role to play in this judgment which will come upon the angels i mean it's interesting uh, i'm not sure what in what what role uh, you know we humans we believers will play in this uh, but it looks like when you know god finally brings judgment upon them even we will have some say in the matter we too will in some way be involved in this judge you know in this judicial process before they are you know sent away into the eternal fire uh, so i'm not sure whether they will be called to come over there and you know present our testimonies of what has been done i have no idea i have no clue i mean uh, but it's it says here that we will in some way participate in judging the uh, angels uh, so uh, so that is the level of um, i mean that's the high status that has been given to humans because we have been created in the image of god we are very special very distinct from all other forms of creation so uh, you know they we have these other forms of creation which hold much higher powers than we do but we are very very special we are distinct because we alone have been created in the image of god himself you know so we actually will get to participate in judging the angels one day um so yes um coming to the work of angels there's a lot that is said about that no details are given about angels themselves and uh, what they are like and all of that but when it comes to the activity we get to know a lot about the things which angels do uh, and of course we must not forget what their first main ministry is revelation 5 11 and 12 if someone can read out revelation 5 11 and 12 then i looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10000 times 10000 they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders yeah uh, so it says over here that there are 10000 times 10000 angels around the throne of god worshiping him so you know it's not like as if a few a handful were left over there near the throne to praise and worship him because someone should be praising and worshiping all the time and then the rest of them went about doing other things no we if you if you look over here the most of the angels are busy doing this one thing which is spending their time in worship and and verse 12 in fact talks about it it says in a loud voice they were saying worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise A lot of terms used, uh, you know, why he deserves worship, why he is worthy, why he must always be held up with honor and praise. So they use a whole bunch of terms over. So they say he, they they understand that he uh, he is worthy or to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. So you know we have this impression that we have a lot of things to do, a lot of jobs to get done. but the main main focus of even humans should be worship of jesus that should in fact be more important than doing ministry work or getting other jobs done or pursuing our you know our uh, goals and dreams more than any of that our main activity should be worship because that's what tens uh, it says thousands upon thousands and 10000 times 10000 what are they doing they're just doing one thing they're around the throne of god and they are constantly in this attitude of uh, worship uh, so after that apart from that there are other activities that they do but this is their main task and that should be our own attitude where for us the main thing is hold upholding god and worshiping him and glorifying his name apart from that yes there are other assignments that you know the lord you know lays upon us uh, so um coming to the earthly ministry that they are involved in uh, one of the main things that jesus tells us about them uh, we see that in uh, matthew 18:10 uh, 
uh, yeah, if someone could read out for us Matthew 18, 10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. It specifically, you know, Jesus is speaking over here and he specifically says, I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my father. And it's talking about these little ones. You know, it says, uh, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my father. Uh, so, uh, which is why some people say, oh, little children will have their own angels and the angels will be their guardians and they'll watch over them. Uh, but over here, it's not really talking about only the little children, because if you look at the overall context of this passage in Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, where, it, where the disciples approach Jesus and they ask, who then is the greatest in the kingdom? And then to explain to them who is the greatest, Jesus takes hold of a little kid, places the child among them. And Jesus says, you know, uh, in verse 3, he says, uh, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so he goes on to explain what does he mean by changing and becoming like a child. Therefore, he says in verse 4, Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child, so what is in what way does he want people to change? He wants them to take the lowly position of this child. Anyone who does that is the greatest. Uh, so over here, the emphasis is on the humility of this child. This child has no uh, false airs about himself. He, he does not go about constantly thinking about who am I? What is my status? How great am I? No, the child just lives on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, it cries, it laughs, it plays. It just is. Uh, so it, it there's a humility about the child. It's only grown-ups who are always constantly thinking, oh, how can I show myself to be superior to others? You know, uh, how can I uh, get more wealth than others? Uh, you know, how can I um, become more powerful and rule over others and control them? Uh, these are generally not the attitudes of a little child. Uh, so over here, uh, Jesus says that we all need to become like that. And then he says in verse 6, uh, um, yeah, so, uh, okay, verse 4, therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, uh, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck, you know, and, and then it goes on to say all of that. So here it's explained in verse six. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble. So here it's talking about believers, these little ones that are being talked about. They should be like little children. But over here, it's not talking only about little children. It's talking about little ones who believe in me. So it's talking about all believers. So all believers seem to have angels assigned to them who probably serve as their guardian angels or I don't know whether they guard them or whether they're just responsible for them in certain ways. I mean, I have no idea uh, because the scriptures don't go into detail regarding that. But it looks like certain angels have been assigned to every believer. And we have not been given the authority to communicate with them or interact with them or pray to them or worship them. No. Their orders are taken directly from the Lord. They are answerable to God. They, they are not meant to talk to us or interact with us. Only when God tells them to approach us, maybe give a vision or give a message, they will do that. And we humbly receive that. And we thank the Lord for it. So in no way do we worship these angels and we are most definitely not supposed to pray to them when we are in danger. We are supposed to call out to the Lord Jesus. He is our Lord and Master. So we must respect the 
authority that god has established the line of you know um of authority that god has established we do not go out out of line and start interacting and communicating with the wrong beings okay so uh, but the fact remains that there are angels assigned to us so what god wants done in our lives it will be done through these angels who have been assigned to us and that is you know um uh, a comforting thing to know that we have a god who is so loving and caring that whenever a need arises he will send whatever is required whoever is required he will send them to help us so our eyes don't need to constantly be on the search seeing who is there to help me whom can i reach out to whom can i approach and we don't need to indulge in all kinds of mystical um, uh, pagan customs to draw upon the attention of these uh, you know spiritual beings no our eyes just need to stay on the lord when the time comes the lord will send out the humans who are required the lord will send out the angels that are required to get the job done on our behalf so our faith and our focus just you know remains on the lord trusting him and he takes care of the rest uh, so in hebrews 1:4 uh, no hebrews 1:14 hebrews 1:14 it says are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation so all of these angels have been assigned to be ministering spirits and they will serve us but they serve us by taking direct orders from god they don't take their orders from us okay so they are ministering spirits that have been appointed and assigned to serve us and help us in different ways uh, so um, that's one of the earthly ministries which they perform a second thing that we see about these angelic beings they are sent to uh, to to strengthen people sometimes when the, when the need is very great uh, so they are uh, god strengthens his people through the angels he sends angels to strengthen us and um, um matthew 4 10 to 11 is a good example of that uh, so if we could have someone read out matthew 4 10 to 11 Then Jesus said to him away with you Satan for it is written you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve then the devil left him and behold angels came and ministered to him okay so we see angels coming and ministering to the Lord Jesus when he was completely human so at uh, in uh, Jesus had finished fasting he had been fasting for 40 days uh you know which means probably he was just you know surviving on water and he had not had any solids and so after the time of fasting he was extremely hungry and god had not yet supplied the food uh and he there was no nearby place where he could go and you know just purchase food or you know eat from some fruit or something there was nothing available so he literally had to just sit over there wait in faith hoping that you know i uh, am uh, um, uh knowing that in god's perfect timing he will send the food which is required so in the meantime while he is waiting satan comes and says you know why don't you just use your power your divine power you know you can actually make uh, bread out of these stones and uh, uh, you know jesus says no that he will not do that and so we have those temptations taking place and then after that after the devil leaves it says angels came and attended to him you know they ministered to him so he had been highly weakened during that entire process of going through all that you know so it had been a very weakening procedure and now at the end of it you have angels coming and strengthening him ministering to him and we see the same thing even in luke 22 43 to 44 you know where it says uh, in the garden of gethsemane while he was preparing himself mentally for what's going to you know happen in the in the in the immediate future uh, where he will have to go through that terrible you know crucifixion process where he will be completely separated from god where he will have to you know um 
uh, endure that whole thing, that whole punishment and wrath and judgment of God alone by himself without any support from his heavenly father. So even as he's preparing himself in prayer for that, it says an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And so uh, at important times when it is absolutely essential, whether we realize it or not, angels are actually sent to strengthen us in our times of weakness. And we see one example of that even in the Old Testament. And it's really nice. Uh, so if maybe we could have someone read out uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 5 to 8. 1 Kings 19, 5 to 8. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. And then verses 7 and 8. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. We see here, you know, uh, he is so drained out over here that he just lies down over there and sleeps. The angel has to literally wake him up on two occasions and say, you know, it's time for you to eat. He's so weak that he's not even able to, you know, get up and look for food on his own. And so at that time, you have the angel being sent, you know, to strengthen him. Uh, so there are instances uh, mentioned both in the Old Testament and New Testament where angels are sent specifically to strengthen a person, to provide for them. Here in this particular case, it looks like as if, you know, the angel even bakes the bread, you know, over the coals because he's not strong enough to cook for himself. Uh, so um, uh, we have one example here. So in, in our you know, current day, uh, maybe we will not visibly see the angel, but when the time comes, when the need is there, God will actually send the angels to physically strengthen us, you know, in our time of need. Uh, so... Uh, because they are supposed to be ministering angels who are, who are there, who have been appointed to serve us, to assist us. Um, we also see the angels taking a very act, playing a very active role in the Great Commission. So we all are supposed to be, you know, fulfilling the Great Commission. And um, uh, the assurance that Jesus gave us, you know, when he gave us the Great Commission, he said, I will be with you. No, right to the end of the age and so he releases his angels uh, to help us and assist us in this great commission whenever it is required um, so um, we see um, we let we'll, we look at we'll begin by looking at a couple of verses there are many 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 verses to look at but maybe we can initially just look at two verses and see what role the angels played you know in uh, in this great commission Acts 8.26. If someone could read out Acts 8.26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert. Yeah, so here uh, you have the angel coming to Philip and giving very specific instructions about what he is to do. Okay, so he's told to go to a particular place in a desert area. Philip would never ever have thought about going over there on his own. But he was specifically instructed by this angel to do that. And that's the only reason why he even goes over there to this very deserted area. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, that is basically how he ends up meeting the 
uh, eunuch who's traveling down that particular road. Otherwise, that eunuch would have continued reading the uh, you know the uh, the scroll of Isaiah and not have understood what is mentioned over there. And then he would not have got saved. He would not have been able to go back and tell all his people about you know uh, this good news of Jesus Christ. So something very uh, important is done. The angel comes to him and says, "You need to go to that place." And so, because of the instructions given, Philip goes over there, and then a whole bunch of you know um, uh, salvation events take place as a result of that. So uh, the angels uh, are sent sometimes to tell us exactly what to do, so that we will uh, you know fulfill this great commission that has been given to us. In the same way, there's another thing that we see about this uh, um, Acts. 10.3, Acts 10.3, if someone could read out. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision he distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, Cornelius. Yeah, yeah. So over here, you have the angel not visiting the, um, the servant of God, but rather the angel is coming to someone who is not yet a believer. And the instruction is given to this unbeliever and he is told, you know, you need to uh, approach someone and that person will tell you the uh, good news. So... Uh, so we have angels working on the side of the servants of God, telling them what they are supposed to do. At the same time, you have them also working in the lives of the unbelievers, preparing them and getting them ready to receive the message of salvation. So we see there's a lot of active involvement of the angels in the uh, great commission that we are involved in. So at some point of time, if we sense in our hearts that we are meant to go and talk to someone, make a phone call to somebody, you know, send a WhatsApp message to some person. If we sense that in our hearts, it may be God who has sent an angel to urge us, to kind of, you know, nudge us. Uh, and we feel compelled to, you know, maybe get on our knees and pray for that particular person or actually pick up the phone and, you know, and talk to that person. So when we sense these things, it is good for us to, you know, follow the leading which the Lord is bringing uh, because then uh, who knows, you know, some life can be changed through us. So uh, we must be aware that the angels are very, very actively involved in, uh, you know, directing people with regard to the Great Commission. And um, another thing to note down is when it, you know, in the earlier passage where, you know, Philip uh, is the one that the angel approaches, uh, Acts 8, 26 is where we saw the angel of the Lord, you know, talks to Philip and says, go down, go, go to that particular road and all of that. And then in Acts 8, 29, um, uh, it says, the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip, you know, goes over there to the chariot and then he says, you know, shall I explain to you what is there? And then he goes on to give the explanation and all of that. Uh, so over here we see that uh, the instructions about going over there to the chariot, what road to take and all of that is given by the angel. But when it comes to actually explaining from the uh, scroll of Isaiah, who is the one who helps him to do that? It says so clearly in Acts 8.29, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit tells Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And then under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Philip starts to explain to the man about the, um, you know, the scroll of Isaiah. So the salvation message, the words that we would actually use to share the you know, gospel message, all that will be provided by the Holy Spirit Himself. It's just the uh, message, the messenger, the guidance, as in you know, go in this direction, go down that road, or pick up the phone, talk to so and so. You know, the instructions are given by the angels. But what do I speak, Lord, when the time comes? What do I say? Uh, how should I, you know, address the person? Uh, what what specific points do I touch upon? All that guidance is given by the Holy Spirit. The angel is just there to follow basic instructions and you know send you off in a particular direction. That's all. But we depend on the Holy Spirit to actually fulfill the Great Commission.
Okay, so that is something that we need to keep in mind. Um, and so we see that uh, angels are very, very much interested in the Great Commission. And in fact, it makes them happy when anyone becomes saved, which is what we see in Luke 15, 10, you know, where Jesus is speaking these words and Jesus says, I tell you, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So uh, the angels are actively involved in the Great Commission. They are very happy every time somebody gets saved. There is much rejoicing when, 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 you know, whenever that happens. And so they are willing to do their part in bringing this about. Are we willing to do our part? Are we sensitive to the leading of God and to the angels that he sends so that we will you know, not be busy with our own schedules, but we will be willing to go out of our way and go and visit that person that we feel, that we sense that we should go and visit? Are we willing to invest that time, put in that effort to do whatever we have to do from our side? Another thing that we see about the angels is that um, they are uh, messengers who have been sent to uh, you know, do something special um, in the sense uh, when in Acts 5, 19 to 20. Yeah, maybe we could look at that particular example. Acts 5, 19 to 20, please. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. In this, uh, on this occasion, it was not enough to just give them instructions. That also, a um, miracle had to be done. So you have the angel of the Lord opening the doors of the jail, bringing them out, and then they are given instructions about where to go and what to do. Uh, the same thing with regard to, uh, you know, um, a ship on which Paul was traveling, he and his companions, and then they are in this huge storm. It looks like they're all going to die. And then it says over there in Acts 27, 23 to 26, it says, you know, Paul talks about that and he says, last night an angel of the of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul, you must stand trial before Caesar and all of that. You know, so it goes on to talk about a whole bunch of things. Uh, so over here, um, in this particular um, crisis situation, the earlier passage, we know, uh, which I think it was Nina who read that out. So in the earlier passage, we saw that it, they were in a prison. You know, they were imprisoned. And so then it took a special intervention of an angel for them to be released from that jail and to come out. And here we see they're uh, they're uh, in a huge storm and the ship is getting tossed about and they're wondering whether they're all going to die. And so in this particular crisis situation, you have another angel coming over here and comforting Paul and telling him, you know, uh, don't worry, you are meant to go to Rome. So you will stay alive. You will be able to make it over there. And then ma many other instructions are given. So we have active intervention of angels when there is a crisis. Um, and we see the same thing even in, in Daniel 6.22, where Daniel says, my God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. Uh, okay, so um, so many examples. I mean, so many examples in scripture about what how angels, you know, actively intervened and prevented something dangerous from happening. Uh, Genesis 19, 10 to 11, uh, where you have those uh, that huge crowd coming to Lot's house, uh, you know, when when the when he's trying to protect those um, those angels who have come over there. And so then it says over there in Genesis 19, verse 11, then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old with blindness, so that they could not find the door. OK, so we have all of these um, e incidents which show that uh, angels are sent by God to help his people when there is a time of crisis. Um, so when we cry out to the Lord for help, when we are trying to do his work, when we are living for him, when we are following his purposes for our life. And in such a, in such a time when there is a crisis and we cry out without our realizing it, they may have been actually angels sent, you know, to, to, uh, to assist us on those occasions. We don't realize it, but then they are there and they perform the task for which God has sent them. Um, 
so we also come to another main aspect you know in which angels are involved and that of course will be in the judgment process so uh, we see that we see so many uh, you know scri scripture passages on that how the angels are uh, will be used by god to bring about uh, judgment and um, maybe we can look at matthew 13 40 to 41 if someone could read out for us matthew 13 40 to 41 As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the yeah, yeah, yeah. So here it talks about how these angels are sent specifically to separate those who belong to the kingdom of God and you know those who now are now you know destined for the kingdom of darkness so they are separated and it's the angels who do it so um there are things which god you know performs by just speaking a word but then there are things that he does through his angels okay so they are actually sent out to do this task um so in the end in the end time before you know the the, the before the judgment day of god uh, the angels will actually go about separating the people of God from the others, and uh, so they will be marked. The people of God will be specially will be specially marked as being belong as belonging to the Lord, and so no harm will come upon them. So we see all of this, um, and um, in Matthew twenty six, where Jesus is speaking, uh, you know, he says in verses fifty two to fifty four. Matthew 26, 52 to 54, you know, Jesus says, uh, Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Okay, so um, this is at that, at that time when, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the soldiers come to capture him, to arrest him. So at that time, Jesus says, If I wanted to, I could actually ask 12 legions of angels to come and they would uh, come and take care of me. But then, you know, uh, that is not the purpose for which I have come to this earth. And so he chooses not to, you know, have himself rescued from that situation. Uh, but over here, it basically talks about 12 legions of angels. And one legion actually includes 6,000. So if you're talking about 12 legions of angels, uh, you know, it would be basically 72,000 angels. Uh, so um the the numbers of angels on god's side are enormous and it probably you know uh, uh, yeah it, it actually exceeds the number of fallen angels uh, because uh, we we are told that one third of the angels chose to rebel against uh, the lord which means the rest you know have not rebelled against the lord so the the legions of angels who are there to fight for God, uh, to fight the demons in the end time. There are a huge, large number of angels available to the Lord. And uh, so the, you know, the, the victory is always on God's side. Now, just to look at that uh, you know, scripture which talks about that, um, maybe before that, we could also look at uh, another thing which the angels do in their heavenly capacity, uh, Revelation 8. Three to three to five. Yeah, um, yeah. If someone could re read out for us Revelation eight, three to five. Another angel who had a golden 
censor came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it on the earth. And that came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Here we see angelic involvement in the prayers of people. You know, I'm here at APC every evening we've been having the evening prayer. Now in the natural realm, you may just see a bunch of people seated over there, you know, in the physical hall. And then all of us here, you know, who are watching online and participating. Uh, so we don't see anything much happening in the natural realm. But one thing is for sure, whenever God's people are praying to their Lord and Savior, God releases his angels and the angels do a lot of things in answer, you know, in indirect um, connection with the prayers. So once we do our praying and we are doing it faithfully and sincerely, a lot of other things get released and activated in the spiritual realm. And here it talks about, here it's using symbolic language. I, I accept that, but something is being actively done by the angels to release God's purposes. So um, this angel over here, he is, uh, you know, taking those prayers and God instructs him to take that censer, which is filled with incense and filled with God's prayers. And, to, and it says over here to hurl it upon the earth. And as a result of that, there's a great judgment which comes upon the wicked, you know, who have been persecuting the people of God. So uh, there are angels involved in answering the prayers and in getting God's uh, work done. So we may think, what is this just a bunch of Christians sitting over there and praying to somebody whom they cannot even see? But in the supernatural realm, uh, there's a lot of divine activity that God initiates. And he uses his angels uh, to, uh, to, to start doing things in answer to what has been prayed. So uh, none of our prayers go to waste. None of our prayers get ignored. They all get gathered. All our prayers, even, even our simple prayers, are all gathered in God's presence. And then he uses the angels to do something with those prayer requests to accomplish his purposes on the earth. Uh, so um, we could not really look at you know the passages which talk about uh, the way these angels function during times of judgment. Um, so and also we could not really look upon uh, you know the end of what will happen to them. Uh, so for that you could maybe look at Revelation chapter twelve, verses seven to nine, where it talks about how for a you know, um, certain period of time, uh, the ma the archangel Michael and his holy angels, how they fight the fallen angels, and they the these demonic beings are you know confined to the earth for a certain period of time, uh, and then after that, the final judgment, which is talked about in Revelation twenty, where they are, where they all will be um, you know thrown into the lake of fire. So. Uh, we could not really get into the details of those things. But one thing we can say very clearly, in God's perfect timing, the judgment of God will be released. And at that time, uh, you know, there in, in, in Revelation 12, we get to know that their activities will be restricted for a certain period of time. And then, in fact, in the beginning of Revelation 20, even Satan's activities are restricted, where he is, you know, um, imprisoned in the abyss for a certain uh, for, for, for a thousand years. And then after that, he and his forces are released for a little while and there'll be a great battle. And after that, they all are thrown into the lake of fire. So uh, that's basically their end. So even though they regarded themselves as most powerful, there was nothing that they could do against God because God is all powerful. And we are on his side, on the, on the side of the Lord. And so um, as long as we stay under his protection and covering, we can be sure that he will release his angels to work on our behalf and accomplish all that is meant to be accomplished in our lives. So that we have the Lord with us. So we have nothing to fear.
So um, yeah, we know we, we are kind of out of time, so we would have to close. Uh, but I hope that at least some of the information that we know we covered today has been helpful to you. And um, so you know, let's just close with a word of prayer. We thank you so much, a lot, for all the things that we could uh, learn today about uh, these angels whom you have created to minister to us, to serve us, and to help us. And so we thank you, O Lord, that even as we keep our eyes focused on you, even as we continue to uh, follow your purposes and obey you and submit to you, as long as we are doing that, you will take care of all the other details, O Lord. You will release the angels and, and cause them to do whatever it is that is required of them so that, Lord, our interests are protected, so that we are taken care of so that uh, we are guarded and shielded and strengthened uh, according to your will. So we thank you, O oh Lord, that you have created beings so powerful uh, to work on our behalf, to guard our interests. Thank you that, Lord, you have considered us that important, that precious. We thank you, O oh Lord, for this deep love that you have towards us, that we were made in your own image. So we pray that, Lord, we would honor you in all that we do, and we would never be sidetracked to worship other beings, but that, Lord, always we would learn to focus on you and, and acknowledge that you are high above any other created being. And we pray that all glory and honor will always be directed towards you alone. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for you know uh, staying up to the end. And thank you so much to those of you who you know uh, read out the scriptures. Uh, so I really appreciate that. And we'll meet again next week. Yes.